All right. Um, it's two, and the room is already virtually full, so I think we can slowly get started. Um, my name is Benjamin. Benjamin, I'm based in France. I'm a developer advocate for the Zephyr project at the Linux Foundation. And today I want to share, so yeah, I'm not super happy about the title, but the short story is that I want to share some tips and pointers to things that might help you be more productive when writing embedded software in general, no matter what platform you're using. If you happen to use Zephyr and the Zephyr real-time operating system, it might the tips might be even more useful, but uh, it turns out that it's actually just talking about some, yeah, some of the things that can help you when it comes to emulating, when it comes to trying to get uh, and to improve your security story, things like that. So, yeah, like I said, I'm uh, Benjamin. I've been with the Zephyr project for a few months now, but I've been doing open source and IoT for many years. Uh, did a bit at the Eclipse Foundation. I was also part of the um, Azure IoT uh, product group at Microsoft. I've been hacking around with lots of open source, open hardware stuff. This silly picture, some of you might have seen that before. I, like during COVID, I ended up tinkering with Arduinos and stuff and building some kind of artificial nose using like TensorFlow running on MCUs, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, these days I'm spending a lot of time on Zephyr. And like I said, it's a disclaimer and or good news because you don't have to use Zephyr to hopefully take away some uh, interesting tips uh, from this session. Some of the things that are painful whenever you end up writing embedded software and whether it is, quite frankly, as a hobbyist or more like in a more professional capacity if you're interested in like building actual um, end-user products, there's many pain points, but some of them are listed here. Hardware can be a pain because like, it's difficult to debug, it's difficult to have like, um, efficient round trips when it comes to testing your software. Plus, hardware might not even be available uh, these days, and you need to be able to, uh, to maybe jump from one architecture to the other or from one silicon vendor to the other because the sensor or the piece of equipment that you were planning on getting has all of a sudden uh, years of lead time because uh, yeah, COVID and like silicon shortage uh, have um, messed up a lot of things there. Uh, of course, resources are limited, so you need at some point some tools, some ways to make the, the best of the kind of resources you have. So I'm going to try and talk about some of the tools that can help there. Um, sometimes embedded is lagging behind in terms of like, getting to a point where you do at least some kind of testing of, the, of your code, ideally getting to the point where you do even like continuous integration, maybe continuous delivery. But like historically, this hasn't necessarily be, been a practice uh, necessarily implemented in the embedded world. So I'm going to show also a few things there. Um, managing the provenance of your software, especially if you end up putting some open source bits and some third party libraries into your embedded system, how can you manage that efficiently? And security, of course, like if you care about IoT, of course the, um, uh, the S in IoT stands for security, right? We all know that. And uh, again, some tools there. Um, starting with the hardware, one thing, that I think was really interesting uh, in this survey that Avnet, so the, the big um, electronic components supplier did, I think they did that uh, about a, a year and a half ago, uh, a survey of their customers and their community, but it's probably, would probably be the same findings today. Um, the chip shortage, chip shortage really uh, changed in a big way the way people uh, uh, build their embedded um, uh, products and embedded designs. And, looking at some of the, uh, the, the, the insights there, but like people if effectively, they say that now, nowadays, due to uh, longer lead times, uh, which are not expected to, to improve, by the way, people, like the way they pick up their, their parts for their design is, is pretty much driven by the availability rather than the preference. And basically what that also means is that when you get started building a new solution, a new product, you might not even have the hardware at hand at all in the first place, and or whatever hardware you pick up for your initial V1, your initial POC, might be completely different from what you get uh, eventually um, and what you manage to secure for, for, for going production. So this is also 
a reasonably old screenshot, but I could have updated it, and I'm pretty sure I would have found occurrences of, like, at some point in time, last year I was interested in getting myself uh, this particular developer kit, only to realize that the lead time was over a year, which is, eh, that's, and that's not, not, not the, the only one, right? So that's, uh, but it could very well be that this is like the perfect solution for my particular idea, my particular um, design, and I really want to get started. How can it still do that? Well, over the past few years, there's been lots of um, tools, many of them actually being, uh, being open source uh, and or uh, uh, reasonably open source, like m most, of, most of them uh, providing, uh, um, uh, being, being made available in, in open source. And I want to talk about some of them and show you some of the things that you may not know, uh, and I see a lot of people taking pictures, so that so that's probably a good sign that there are some new um, new names maybe for, for some of you, but yeah, like simulating your um, and emulating your microcontroller is one thing, and that's, I mean, there's many ways to look at it. I could have put maybe QMU on that list, but sometimes you need to do more. When you build some kind of IoT device, there will be sensors involved. How do you emulate your sensors? How do you um, emulate the connection to whatever, whatever it is you use for co communicating with the outside, outside world, whether it is Wi-Fi, whether it is Bluetooth, uh, what can be done there? So in no particular order, showing you a bit of the tools. So this one might throw some people off because this will feel very maker, may, may, very DIY um, uh, oriented except that it's actually really powerful. It's called, um, it's called Wokui, and should you be targeting uh, ARM silicon and or expressive, like ESP32 kind of, kind of silicon, you will usually get pretty far, actually, with, with, with Wokui in terms of testing not only your embedded uh, software, but potentially also the interaction with uh, sensors and or actuators, displays, sort of stuff. So, really quickly short demo of what it means from a sort of a, a general standpoint and as well as what would it mean if I were to try and use it for my Zephyr embedded development. So let's say I am targeting some kind of ESP32 thingy. Again, right from my web browser and or this could be something also integrated in an IDE such as uh, VS Code and maybe a bunch of others. There's, like, there's APIs to do it um, more locally if you don't want uh, or don't, uh, yeah, don't feel comfortable running it from your browser. But essentially, left-hand side, this would be, in this particular case, an Arduino, sort of Arduino-based kind of uh, embedded application. I can actually run it against the fully simulated um, um, uh, hardware all the way to the point which, I mean, it might be small for some of you folks. I'm going to try and make it slightly bigger. What we see here on the simulated or emulated display is the result of our embedded app that's running. And we kind of guess that it's doing not only like display and GUI things, but it's also simulating and emulating connection to a virtual Wi-Fi. So like the Effectively, if we were to look at the code on the left-hand side, like there's effectively connection to SSID, blah, 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 which is fully emulated in the browser. And uh, of course, like we, I could be wiring up more sensors, like here we have a push button and whatnot. I could, do, I could be doing more than that. And or one thing that I could do as well is um, opening up the, um, whoops, the, uh, the palette. Let me just try and find the shortcut, actually. Mm, I'm confused. There we go. The, yeah, the, the palette, uh, the command palette, similar to what I would have in VS Code, and I will just look at, and this is small, so I'm going to read, read it out loud, but upload firmware and start simulation. Essentially, what I want to do here is take a, um, uh, a firmware that I have already built on my machine, which happens to be using Zephyr, and I'm, I think this is going to be just like blinking an LED, so, but just for the sake of the demo, let's see, uh, like this is, exactly the same ELF that I would be deploying on my real ESP32, except that here, well, it's running on emulated, um, emulated hardware, and we see the, the blue LED uh, blinking or pulsating, and we see in the shell, uh, we have the, 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 the Zephyr prompt. I mean, this is one way to, to, to emulate things, and I, I kind of like the, the, the way, um, how easy it is to do things like simulate the Wi-Fi connection. It might not be your thing, uh, 
if you you're doing something more more complex than just a couple sensors and, and things like that. But it's it can take you pretty far. Um, something else is uh, so yeah, that was for demo. Another really interesting tool, open source. Uh, it's called Renode. Uh, again, if you're targeting all sorts of ARM uh, Cortex or ARM whatever, really, um, uh, and, and a bunch of others. Uh, it can also take you really, really far. Uh, so this one will, will run fully um, uh, locally on your machine, although you can also use it in CI, CD, as, as we will see later, if you want to do some kind of like testing and things like that. So you can also run it in like a Docker container sort of thing. But yeah, Renode um, is uh, also pretty cool. I have uh, my Renode uh, console right here, which I will make as big as I can, maybe. Um, yeah, so you have a, you have like a common uh, command line interface where you can instantiate um, machines, like the description of what is the the kind of board that you are targeting. Like, is, so in my case, I will I already have the description of the SEM32 dev kit that I am targeting, and then. I want to deploy an app on top of on top of it, and this is going to fully emulate the hardware. Like this is really, so what we see here is one of the code samples that you would get from Zephyr. Zephyr does many things, but one thing that it does is that it, it provides you with the pre-integration with the LVGL uh, embedded graphical um, user interface framework, and so this is the sample of like using um, uh, LVGL to do UI stuff. To the point where I actually have like integration with my um, with a, an emulated touchpad. I have, uh, of course, the screen as well, and I could, I mean, I could do many things um, with as if I were to really interact with the, with the physical hardware. And one thing that I also want to call out because I think it's pretty powerful to sort of modernize uh, embedded uh, development practices is. The frame buffer that you see here that's effectively rendering some kind of GUI, you can fully interact with it through a, an API, including uh, using the, um, the testing framework that um, Renode interfaces with, because uh, that's the robot framework. And you can do things like, hey, I'm going like, to run my, um, my built embedded application out of my CI CD pipeline. Like, whenever someone does a commit, I deploy the app on the emulated firmware. I wait 10 seconds, I take a screen capture, and I compare it pixel by pixel with a reference image, right? And that way I, I test whether there's been regressions or not in my UI. This is the kind of thing that, that I mean, that we know it made possible. And as of actually the latest release of Zephyr, the integration with the robot framework and like making it easy for people to write the kind of tests that I just described is effectively supported upstream. Uh, where am I? Wrong Chrome. Where is my actual Chrome? Here it is. Uh, something else. That's this one is actually really really new, uh, but it's and it's also kind of cloud-based. It's uh, something that ARM provides uh, and that 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 runs in in the cloud. And I actually only tested it and tried it myself a couple of days ago, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it happens to just work. And it's kind of like similar in terms of experience to what some of the things I, I've shown with, uh, with Zephyr, um, with, sorry, with WalkWe or with Renode. But essentially, and I think I might have um, the demo, um, yeah, like right here, right in my browser, again, like I would be simulating some kind of STM32 uh, dev kit, and I would have access to the, um, the shell. I mean, like whatever my Zephyr application is doing, I can interact with it through the console, if it, expo if it exposes some kind of uh, console interface, I can interact with the um, simulated uh, fake um, environmental sensors. So like, I want to pretend that the temperature is 35 Celsius, whatever. This would be uh, all um, running on, on, on simulated silicon. So that's, yeah, all those tools, I mean, some of them will, one way or the other, they will be frustrating and or they will not if, like, effectively behave 100% like the actual uh, silicon, but they can save you a lot of times and or help you test uh, a few things that you wouldn't have been able to test um, um, as easily, potentially. A few words uh, on, the, um, yeah, on the fact that when you deal with embedded, it's sometimes hard to like really optimize your application. Sometimes, well, you really want to make sure that it actually fits in what you have. 
and or sometimes it might be more um, for, for cost efficiency, like you want to effectively make your app even smaller and only to realize that, hey, you know what, now that I'm, I've made it smaller, I can target maybe a slightly smaller uh, SOC, I don't need as much um, memory, and I can save a few cents here and there on my bomb. Uh, so that could be, um, yeah, that, that could be the kind of things that you want to look at. One tool that's really well integrated with, um, uh, and that, that works just out of the box when you're um, using Zephyr, but pretty sure you would uh, be able to use it just the same with any other RTOS, really, is a pen cover, and it goes pretty far in terms of uh, providing you stats with regards to how your binaries uh, um, uh, look like, in terms of like what is the, the, the size code-wise, what is the memory that your code is going to use, uh, uh, what is, what, what is going to be the worst case uh, scenario in terms of how much uh, memory you're, um, uh, you're going to use on your stack, uh, sort of stuff. So just, yep, yeah, main point really of my talk is to leave you with a bunch of pointers. Many of the things that I'm mentioning are way more, uh, uh, way better explained probably in the documentation, but now at least you know they exist. And so for using something like pen cover, it's really straightforward. You just build your app uh, and making sure you turn on uh, the compile flag um, config stack usage, and then you just run the thing. And just really briefly, uh, so we are done with um, Renode now. Uh, yep, yeah, here. So building my app, so whatever, a Zephyr Hello World. And I just want to show you some of the, um, and this is really maybe familiar to, to some of you, but sort of the, the thought process when it comes to using those kind of tools. I just built um, the thing, and then now I run um, the pen cover. So it's already integrated in, in the Zephyr uh, build system. Like, and effectively, my browser just already opened up with pen cover enabled. One thing that I could use the tool for is, I mean, I just ran a Hello World. It turns out this Hello World is doing some basic a printing Hello World on the console. Eventually, my real application going production like in, uh, and building a real end user product, I might want to turn off any sorts of communication on the serial uh, and on the UART altogether. And here, with the tool, I can really easily navigate to all the bits and all the, all, the, all the modules that make up my app, and I can really easily realize that, hey, driver-wise, the serial thing, it's actually take, eating up 1.4 Ks uh, uh, in terms of like code. At least I know that whenever I want to go uh, smaller, that's certainly one big area of improvement, right? And I can also like dig deeper into every, uh, pretty much every uh, every module, and see like what's the stack usage and things like that. And I think it can, it can really help. Um, and also for security reasons, actually, we're going to see that turning off and removing some um, some unused uh, features and or um, uh, areas of, of your uh, of your embedded code might might be useful as well. But yeah, that's for um, pen cover. If you don't care about the sort of the having something as detailed, like you can also just rely on the more um, um, simplified reports that you can also get out of the box with the, with the Zephyr build system. Things like getting uh, overall RAM usage or ROM usage is also something that you can get uh, through those um, options. Um, another thing that can help with regards to optimization and or making the best of whatever uh, resources you have available is there is a tool uh, that you may or may not know exists in, in, in Zephyr, but I, I didn't know initially and I find it really convenient, which effectively you turn on and it will automatically, every 10 seconds or so, it will look at how full um, uh, the, uh, the stack for each thread ever, ever, ever was, right? And just telling you that, hey, uh, you've Bill, you've been allocating this amount of memory to this background thread that's going to acquire sensor data, but you probably don't need all that much because looking at the actual execution, uh, you never used all um, all the memory, so don't and, and make make it smaller, right? And so the um, this one actually um, I can also show really quickly uh, in in um, in Renode, like I'm doing demos with everything uh, simulated here, I guess. But um, yeah, um, I have another sample, which is uh, yeah, Thread Analyzer. So launching an emulated application, which is, again, a, a hill world with a bunch of threads. And like I said, every 
few seconds, it would dump, um, it would give you information with regards to, hey, this particular thread uh, used like 29%, like thread A used 29% uh, out of the 1K that was allocated to it. So maybe like if it stays the same over the course of the entire life cycle of the application, maybe that's, that's too much and you can cut that in half, just give, give, uh, leave a bit for, for safety. But that, that's, I mean, that's super easy to turn on in the, um, in the Zephyr build and just uh, enable uh, the, the feature. Similarly, something that super easy to enable. I mean, oftentimes it would actually be uh, there uh, by default if you ran some of the existing code samples, etc. Is the Zephyr shell? Just want to make sure that I call out that it's uh, it's full of hidden gems. Sometimes in terms of really helping you. Um, so of course it's going to make during your sort of um, um, prototyping phase. It's going to make your app slightly bigger, but it's going to also make your life much much easier in terms of. Yeah, I have this, uh, this, driver, this sensor, uh, this I squared C sensor for which I'm building a driver and my driver kind of doesn't work. Well, you're going to probably troubleshoot what's going on by just like interacting with your I squared C registers like manually through the, um, through the Zephyr shell. Uh, or if it's SPI, you would do it similarly or you interact with the ADCs. Or if you have enabled any kind of like file system, you can interact with the file system. You have Wi-Fi in your design in, in, your, um, in your stack, then, well, you can actually discover the SSIDs, figure out your uh, signal strength, et cetera, et cetera. And it's extensible as well. And if you are to build uh, your own app, um, it might be, in addition to logging and, and to debugging, you might actually want to uh, come up with your own um, commands so that you can uh, uh, make, make your life uh, easier there. So that's, um, yeah, I guess that's another one. Um, something else, uh, CI, CD how to maybe again modernize uh, um, embedded development there. One thing that I want to call out, because I think it's, it's a really good uh, example of how to uh, get started with, with it, is the um, example application that the Zephyr project is maintaining. And so one of the things this app helps you do is sort of learn a lot about the best practices in terms of how should you uh, organize your, uh, your source code and your source tree. Um, like, yeah, what's the best approach to have, if you have your own driver, like where, where should you put it? Um, and something else that it does is that it shows you how using GitHub Actions, but uh, really uh, it doesn't matter. What, what, what matters is that it shows you the few lines of, of, of script, of, of almost, if you will, to uh, fire up a, a Docker container, set up the Zephyr build environment, Zephyr SDK, Zephyr, Zephyr tool chains, and whatnot, and then build the app, potentially run the test suites that have, uh, that have uh, been, um, um, that are part of the, of, the, of the repo for this app, and then get a result, right? Build successful, build failed, test successful, test failed. So it's I mean, I would really recommend that if you want to get started with Zephyr, you start essentially with this particular application, and then you start tweaking uh, and, and um, changing it towards your, your actual code. But um, yeah, what essentially that means um, is that if I were to go in the GitHub Actions section, I can, I mean, I can look back in time of all my like previous builds, whether they were successful or not. I can get access to the test results, download them, and I can even get to the point where I can download the pre-built firmware like, that was entirely run um, in, uh, like in, a, in a CI/CD uh, on a CI/CD machine independently from my own local um, desktop. And this particular firmware, I can try and, and test uh, on the real thing, the real hardware, or maybe on Renode and things like that. So that's um, yeah. I mean, it's there. Uh, there's. Um, yeah, just, just look at the, at the code samples and things like that to um, start maybe improving the way you're doing things. Um, something else, so it might be, I mean, the more we go into the presentation, the less I'm happy with the title that I gave to the presentation in the first place. It doesn't have to do with necessarily with productivity. It's more about like, you might not know these kind of tools exist and they might save you a lot of time and potentially money uh, when you're doing something in a, in a really in a more professional capacity. I don't know if you're aware or, or familiar with the notion of SBOM. Of course, we talk a lot about bombs in, uh, in the hardware world, but like when you ship a product, yes, it has hardware, but it's also pulling in lots of software components. Like I said earlier, lots of them probably um, are 
open source in, in, um, in one way or the other, tracking the provenance and like keeping track of sort of the manifest of what it is that you put in a particular um, uh, revision of, of, your, uh, of your product might be, uh, might be a problem. There are tools and there are standards to do that, like the SPDX standard helps uh, really sort of annotate and decorate uh, open source uh, code with all the metadata that helps uh, track the provenance, like this particular source file that ended up being compiled and built and linked into your uh, application, well, it comes from probably from some kind of GitHub repo, so it has a SHA associated to it. So this is something that can be captured, right? And so that's something that actually is really easy to capture when you build an app built on Zephyr. Uh, you just, again, have to rely uh, and leverage the, the built-in um, uh, build, build system to just like do as instructed here, which is whenever you prepare your um, you prepare a build, you just uh, need to um, initiate uh, the, the 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 workspace so that so as it has the SPDX um, uh, things in in it, and then you build, and then you get a report. And I want to show really really quickly what what what's the the output there. Um, so killing the the pen cover thing, just just showing you that it's really just taking you. Uh, seconds most of the time to do, to do the stuff. Um, so we, um, yeah, so I'm going to initiate the um, SPDX thing, uh, build, uh, do, do, do. Yeah, build the same sample as earlier. There we go. So I built some kind of, some kind of hello world. But now, in addition to my uh, binaries um, uh, and to my, um, my actual application, I also have uh, some manifests that could be useful further down the road because they actually captured uh, a lot of information, which, I mean, I, there's a tool that I can use to visualize it. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, hmm, it's not there. Yeah, I think I screwed up the first step, didn't I? I mean, it's all right. Uh, I don't have to do this, this particular demo. Uh, let's see, try again. Yeah, I'm doing something obviously wrong there. Uh, yeah, whatever. The, the idea is that in addition to your binary, you would have captured in a manifest and in a very standard actually uh, format, you have the list of all the individual source files that ended up being making it into your, uh, into your application. And whenever, like six months down the road, there is a CVE uh, and, and a vulnerability report for a particular open source component that you know that you're using, you can know whether you're impacted or not. Because I mean, depending on, you might not be uh, shipping the exact same version, but through all the metadata that's being captured there, uh, this is something that you can, um, uh, you can um, be aware of. And yeah, last but not least, uh, Things to help you build more secure. So I'm like full disclaimer, I'm no security expert, uh, but I like to rely on whatever tool I can find out there to help me at least be more aware of things that I could do better to at least improve my, my, my security posture. When it comes to securing some kind of IoT or embedded device, well, it's essentially to over, uh, um, maybe oversimplify things, but Usually, one thing that you want to do before you effectively go production is make sure that you've disabled all the things that can make your device and your solution less secure. Like if during prototyping, you've been using like lots of logging and you've been uh, outputting lots of information on the on, on the console and things like that. This is probably all those, and you have like um, uh, compilation, uh, like debugging symbols enabled and things like that. You want to turn that off. And there might be, and again, like I, I will focus on Zephyr, but I'm pretty sure it's the same uh, in other places. There might be features available to you in, in the framework and in the OS that may make things uh, more and more secure, like uh, enforcing like memory protection features, hardware protections, whatever. So there is a tool in Zephyr that many people don't know exists, uh, but that I find really, really uh, interesting to to help you sort of realize what it is that you might be doing wrong or that you might want to have a, a, a closer look at. This one is also super simple to trigger. Uh, just run your build, uh, like just build the uh, hardened config target, and it will give you lots of information with regards to things that you may not want to 
you may want to stop using for your uh, um, end, end product. And something as simple as, hey, config boot banner. Like if, even if you're not familiar with Zephyr, I can quickly tell you what that is. It's the kind of prompt that you would get first time you, you boot the system. If there is uh, some kind of serial output, it would give you like the, the actual exact version of Zephyr you're running. This might expose some, this is useful info for, uh, for a potential attacker because they, they know that you might be actually running some kind of vulnerable version of Zephyr or whatnot. Uh, and I mean, similarly, like, are you running, um, are you using the console, are you logging, are you, uh, do you have um, the build output stripped? Uh, in my case, I don't, but what the tool is recommending is that I do, right? I should probably be stripping uh, debugging information. And it would also warn you if you are using experimental features in the kernel. Like, you, you might have very good reasons to do that, but at least, uh, it's yeah. It's it's probably good to for for you to double uh, think about that and and make sure that uh, it's really intentional whenever you're um, running that in production. And with that, I think I left actually plenty of time for questions. Uh, some pointers. Uh, there's many ways for you to learn more and to get involved. But uh, first link will give you that's here for what it's worth. But all the the binaries that I ran against Wokwe against Renode. I put them there just for you to just realize that, yeah, whatever um, existing binary can be easily uh, floated around in, in, in different uh, emulation tools, and it should essentially just work out of the box. Uh, the community is really, really active on Discord, so if following this talk uh, uh, or any talk really this week, there's um, uh, more that you want to discuss with the community, please join uh, the, the Discord channel. And yeah, everything else, the, the usual uh, contact info, and with that, I will um, yeah, take questions if there's any. And if there's anyone from the project that feels that there were some useful tips that I forgot, uh, we can also uh, talk about that. All right, uh, yeah, just shout the question and I will repeat it. Oh, there's, there's a mic, even better. Uh, I yes. think it's working. Yeah. Oh, it's working. So. Uh, so, can we get this presentation somehow? Uh, yes, I should have probably uploaded it in the system. I haven't, but I will, uh, yeah, just like in the next hour or so, I will make sure awesome. that the, the PDF is there. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, that's the whole point. Like, there's tons of pointers. You, you rather have them. Yes. Thank you. There was one here. Uh, you, mentioned the thread, you mentioned the thread analyzer, and uh, I, I've uh, worked with it a little bit, but what I'm missing in it, and maybe is there some configuration to, to add, that it only prints uh, uh, the, um, the data once. So if I have some application that's running, and later on maybe I connect and do some sampling or something else, and I want to see these threads, I don't get that, that data anymore. I th so I think it's by default it's like every 10 seconds or so, uh, and or you can trigger it manually, but like just look for the k-config options around, around it. Like it's. Uh, yeah, it should, it should be more than once. Right? Otherwise, it's not that useful because you, you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Were there questions online? I guess not. I didn't see any. Let me double check before we wrap it up. All right. Well, with that, thank you for your attention. Feel free to reach me online, and I will post the slides. Yes. <laughs>